to the eighth annual Dr. Cy Frank Lectureship. And I also want to say hello to all of the people who are joining online. I'm Diane Mosier, and I'm going to be your MC today, and I am the chair of the Cy Frank Legacy Lectureship Committee. So the University of Calgary, located in the heart of southern Alberta, both acknowledges and pays tribute to the traditional territories of the peoples of Treaty 7, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Kainai, Pekani, and Siksika nations, the Sutsina nation, the Stony Nakoda nation, which is comprised of Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Good Stony, as well as the city of Calgary is home to the Mady Nation 3. On this land and in this place, we strive to learn together, to walk together, and grow together in a good way. So a little bit of housekeeping, um, that uh, there will be question and answers at the end. The lecture will be approximately 45 minutes, plus or minus one minute, I'm told. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, for those who are joining virtually, if you happen to have to leave or get disconnected, you can get back online using the exact same link. Um, in terms of uh, questions, if you are joining online, you can put them in the chat. And there's someone from the McKay Institute who's monitoring this and will answer those questions for you. Um, those who are in person, that there will be a someone with a microphone who will come to you uh, to uh, allow, allow you to answer your questions. This um, lecture is being recorded and it will be shared via email uh, to all registered attendees. So a little bit about the lectureship that Dr. Cy Frank, as you know, was an orthopedic surgeon, a friend to many in the audience, scientist, long-term faculty member in the Cummings School of Medicine and one of the founders of the McKaig Institute, uh, the Bone and Joint Health Institute. Dr. Frank was internationally recognized, known and acclaimed for his visionary efforts to lead and champion the value of multidisciplinary clinical research and this to apply this application to clinical care. Upon his passing in 2015, the University of Calgary and the Cummins School of Medicine established an endowment to create an annual lectureship to honor Dr. Cy Frank's legacy. That uh, this legacy, this lectureship was established to create a showcase to mark the work of individuals, reflect his passion and his commitment to health innovation. Now, I would like to share a video which um, was created a few years ago, which honors his generosity and showcases many his impact on community. It's a huge question to ask about Dr. Frank's contributions because they've been many, they've been varied. Dr. Frank was uh, very integral in orthopedics in Canada and, and, and medicine in general. His innovation in trying to develop new ways to deliver care it was of such a great impact on both Alberta orthopedics and Alberta medicine. Well, I first met Cy um, in an interview process for the 13 inaugural scientific directors of the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. Everyone assured me that he was a great leader, a great individual, uh, and a great scientist. Cy and I worked closely together for the next seven years. Um, he is president of CIHR and him as one of the 13 scientific directors. I worked for Cy uh, at Alberta Innovates Health Solutions when he joined two and a half years ago um, as the CEO. One of the lasting legacies for Cy, I think, has been the establishment of this Centre for Mobility and Joint Health. The McKaig Institute is a big part of that. And what Cy always believed was the power of putting a, an engineer together with a clinician to have that collaborative uh, environment. As a researcher, he had the respect of the entire orthopedic research community throughout the world. One of the great attributes that Cy had was his ability to put it all together, to form a plan, to get people behind that plan, but then to be able to implement the plan. And that is very, very hard. Engineering, kinesiology, nursing, rehab medicine, uh, the hard sciences, rheumatology, orthopedic surgery. 
That was all his vision, and he wanted us all mixed up. He was adamant that we had to be all rubbing shoulders day to day in this multidisciplinary group. So I really believed that research could inform better clinical care, but he worked in the real world, and he understood how he had to make changes locally, how he had to make changes provincially, how he had to affect change nationally. And that really earned him a reputation in Canada and beyond as somebody who passionately believed in better clinical care for people. He had a really strong vision around the value of sharing health information and what that could mean for the improvement of providing services to the patient. He struggled with some of the injury related things that many of his patients did and that helped him I think identify with patients. I think that's what really made him who he was and why he has garnered so much respect is because of that ability to, to relate to people uh, no matter their background, no matter where they come from and be able to bring people together and to share ideas. People felt like he was genuinely interested in what they had to say because he was. The lectureship is intended to uh, promote and to make sure that those uh, enduring qualities that uh, Sai represented are continued uh, even now that he isn't with us. Uh, I think he'd say keep going, you know, he, he leaves behind a, a real huge number of champions that are trying to make the world a better place, that are trying to make it better for patients and it better for clinicians. It is now my pleasure to introduce the 2023 Cy Frank Lecture, Dr. Walter Herzog. Dr. Herzog did his undergraduate training in physical education at the Federal Technical Institute in Zurich, Switzerland in 1978, his doctoral research at the University of Iowa in engineering in 85, and his postdoctoral training at the University of Calgary in neuroscience and biomechanics. Today, he's, uh, he is professor uh, in kinesiology and engineering, an adjunct professor in medicine and in veterinary medicine. He is the co-director of the Human Performance Lab, and he has held the Canada Research Chair Tier 1 in Molecular and Cellular Biomechanics. He also holds the NIG Chair in Mobility and Longevity uh, since, uh, from 2021 to 2026. Um, his research interests are in the musculoskeletal biomechanics with emphasis on mechanisms of muscle contraction, focusing on the role of the structural protein titan and the biomechanics of joint focusing on the mechanism of onset and progression of osteoarthritis. Together with Dr. Cy Frank, he led the Alberta Osteoarthritis Team Grant from 2008 to 2014, which was when I first met Dr. Herzog as well and he's been the president of the American, Canadian, and International Society's Biomechanics. He was the esteemed winner of the Killam Prize in 2018 in engineering and recipient in 2021 of Research of Year Award in the Alberta Science and Technology Organization. So without further ado, Dr. Herzog. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the kind in, in invitation, for the kind introduction. It's uh, an incredible honor to be here, and uh, I'm feeling a bit awkward because I want to do something today, that is, talk about my research, but at the same time show what tremendous influence uh, Cy Frank had on this particular research, and I guess to summarize my entire talk, I can say that I'm talking to you about osteoarthritis today, but I would never talk about osteoarthritis. I probably never would have done osteoarthritis research if it wasn't for Cy Frank. And so I want to kind of uh, combine the scientific talk and at the same time show the interconnections and overlap that we had and the tremendous influence on my career, particularly my early career that he had. So. My talk is uh, um, looking like this. I'm going to have a little an prelude. 
then I'm going to talk about some aspects of Cy Frank, and then I will be talking about post-traumatic osteoarthritis, muscle weakness, and obesity-induced uh, metabolic syndrome-induced osteoarthritis. In this prelude, I want to talk about my family. And uh, I'm from a big family, seven children, six siblings, three older than me, three younger than me. I left for the United States when I was 23 years old. My older sister was 32, my younger sister was 11. And so I really don't know some of my siblings all that well because I never really went home except, you know, for a week here and there, every two or three years. And when we do that, when I do that and we go back, then we have these little reunions, we get together for a dinner and we chat. And to me, what I want to say, which is prelude is, when we chat to each other, it always fascinates me how we lived in the same environment, the same house, the same family, the same village, the same teachers, the same school, and nevertheless, our recollection of events for our family are very different. We talked, for example, last time, just about four weeks ago, we talked about my father's 50th birthday. We were all there. We all saw the same event, but we remembered very different aspects of it. And we remember the same aspects in very different ways. And why am I saying this? I'm saying this because memory and recollections are one's own. And we just saw this beautiful introduction where everybody, many people said how they felt about Sai and what he was to them. And that's what I'm going to do today. These are going to be my recollections. That's how I see them. They might not be accurate. They might not be yours. They are mine. And we all remember history. We all remember people in a different way. So this is what he was for, for me. I just said that we have crossed paths on many occasions in formal ways and also in informal ways. There are crossing paths, there are interconnections between us. And I want to start out with some facts. I assume these are facts because these are directly from his curriculum vitae. And it starts in about 1981. And the reason why I want to start there is because Sai did a research fellowship in San Diego between 81 and 83, and then did a surgical fellowship in 1984 in Toronto. And then he came to Calgary, where he founded this musculoskeletal research group in medicine that then existed between 1984 and 1988. And I arrived in Calgary in 1985. So I had done my PhD. I came here as a postdoctoral trainee, so I was kind of done with my formal student training, and Sai, even though older than me, had just finished his surgical, his medical, and also his research training. <clears throat> so in that sense, we were at similar points in our career, just essentially at the very beginning. And so he had his musculoskeletal research group uh, in 1984, 88, and then that joint, that formed then the JIR group, the Joint Injuries and Arthritis Research Group, and then that turned into the McKeg Center, McKeg Institute, the McKeg Professorship uh, later on. But it all started with that little group that he was uh, the chair and that he kind of founded in 1984. I arrived in Calgary, as I said, in 1985. And uh, I joined the musculoskeletal research group that Sai had established right away um, because Beno Nick, my postdoctoral supervisor, encouraged me, and his student, Friedel Schlapfer, was co-supervised by Sai, and he went there all the time. So just to give you an idea, these meetings were on a Thursday afternoon at 4 p.m. We sat around the table and had coffee, and we chatted for an hour or two. Friedel Schlapfer, me, Sai, Norm Schacker, once in a while, and then a couple of other people that dropped in and out. But the point that I'm trying to make is what now is this fabulous institute and this fabulous thing started out really with a few people chatting to each other on a Thursday afternoon in a reasonably 
unorganized manner. Sai then also overlapped formally with me and us as being the co-director for eight years of the Human Performance Laboratory. And then as was already mentioned by Diane, we then co-led the Alberta Hedge Foundation for Medical Research osteoarthritis team, the Alberta OA team from 28 till 2013. When he went to Alberta Innovates and then Linda Woodhouse and I were able to get some more funding and extend that till uh, 2015. And then at the same time, almost as a team grant, I always had an answer create training grant, which was called Biomedical Engineers for the 21st Century. And there I was kind of the PI and Sai was the co-PI. So our roles were reversed there from the osteoarthritis uh, team grant. So that's how it was. On a, more, on a more personal level, not so much leading teams and that type of things, probably the most important thing that Sai did for me was in 1987. So I had been here a couple of years, I'd done my postdoc, and I came here because I wanted to learn how to do animal research, particularly how to measure internal muscle and joint forces in animal models. And I did that and I came here because there was a fellow here, Andy Hoffer in clinical neuroscience, and he knew how to do that. And that really was a reason for me uh, to come here. However, in 1987, kinesiology was called physical education. Nobody did animal research. Nobody did basic research. It was impossible. And not only that, there was actually quite resistance against the type of work that I wanted to do. And it took, I think, a stubborn person like me to still pursue this. But the reason why this was possible was because Cy Frank organized that I had an adjunct appointment in medicine. And not only that, he made room, he organized room for my animals in medicine and vivarium. And not only that, I had a laboratory available to me to do the type of work that he wanted to do, that I wanted to do. <clears throat> I think I was the only non-medicine person at that time to have a laboratory and facilities here in, in medicine. And then the next important thing was that once I had learned on how to do this internal muscle force measurement and joint measurements and so on, he convinced me that those techniques that I had, where I studied a basic aspect of muscle coordination, that these techniques would be really great to employ in a model of osteoarthritis. And I said, how do you do that? And he said, well, I'll tell you. So he told me how to do that, and I did, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Then I gathered some pilot data, applied to the Medical Research Council of Canada, which is now called CIHR, and um, was, was funded, and ever since then have been funded. But it really started with Sai telling me, you should do and employ the techniques that you have for osteoarthritis. And then the other thing that I will be talking about a little bit is osteoarthritis associated with muscle weakness. Again, that came directly from Sai. He had a resident, David Longino, who wanted to do a muscle weakness model. Sai sent him to me and said, hey, I think Walter will be interested in this. And the rest of history for uh, you know, eight or 10 years, then we did muscle weakness research. And then last but not least, um, the obesity metabolic type of osteoarthritis research that we are doing was motivated by Gillian Hawker, who was at an Alberta osteoarthritis team, invited by Sai, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that particular story. The point that I'm trying to make is in all the OA work, Sai was either directly motivating it, initiating it, or indirectly uh, participating in it. So what is this osteoarthritis business? I didn't know what that was in 1981. I had to go and look it up somewhere. Google didn't exist, internet didn't exist, so I found it somewhere. So, so osteoarthritis is this disease, you know, where the cartilage degrades away, you have changes in the bone, this is osteophytes. There's clinically speaking, uh, joint space narrowing, and then patients that you see, they have uh, joint deformations, they have inflammation, they have pain, there is swelling uh, and stiffness in the joint. That is osteoarthritis. <clears throat> So Sai then, as I said, convinced me to do this post-traumatic osteoarthritis, and I label that the 1990s, because that's what we mostly 
uh, did then after that. And so how did that come about? It came about, as I said, that I did this work, which is called in biomechanics and motor control, the force sharing problem of muscles, where you try to identify how muscles are coordinated and how they work together and how much force they exert at any given instant in time. I wanted to find that out 30 years ago in biomechanics, we still haven't solved it today. But what I learned is I learned how to measure these muscle forces and activation patterns and so on in these animal models. And so Seiden just said, well, why don't you take the model that you have and make it post-traumatic? I said, how do you do that? He said, cut the ACL, cut the anti-accruciate ligament. That produces OA in every animal model I have ever seen. So we did that, and then we measured forces with these transducers that I learned how to make, and with these activity measurement devices, electromyographical electrodes, and we measured also the external forces and moments, and then we had these animals uh, walking or jumping or running or climbing trees, while we measured, as you can see here, for example, four muscle forces and four electromyographical activity measurements. So we could do that. And then we did that, uh, and we, we obtained results like this, where you have here the force of a muscle, the activation pattern, the length of fascicles, a structural parameter called an angle of pination, and muscle lengths, and a variety of other parameters that we could measure. And then we did that before and after the anti accruciate ligament transaction. And so here on this uh, left panel, you see the gastrocnemius and quadriceps forces before, and this is approximately two weeks after measuring the same forces. And you can see that the forces are smaller, uh, significantly smaller. So that was one observation. And the second observation that we immediately saw there was that these forces are very jerky, very jaggedy compared to the more smooth patterns that we have there. And so we wanted to know what was going on. And so from the activity measurement, we then found that before the anti-crucial ligament transaction, you get this very nice uh, one activation pattern, a consistent and continuous uh, pattern of activation during the step cycle, whereas afterwards you get this very interrupted one. You have these four bursts and three bursts and three bursts that then cause this uh, very jagged appearance of the muscle force and the loss of muscle force. So we realized that these muscle forces were down. This was done by several people, but primarily my PhD student at the time, Evelyn Hasler, shown here. And she found that muscle forces following the anti crucial ligament transaction were decreased, ground reaction forces were decreased, muscle activation patterns were completely destroyed, they completely changed. But then, interestingly enough, in this particular model, everything went back to normal. When we measured these same things four or six months later, then everything looked normal, and you had absolutely no idea that this particular animal had an anti crucial ligament transected. And of course, in humans, when they have an injury, we try to get them back to normal movement, to normal muscle forces, to normal activation. But despite all that, the knee joint osteoarthritis continued. So this is about two years later. There's a big hole in cartilage in the, in the tibial plateau. We let these animals go a little bit further, and they reached end-stage osteoarthritis. So then the question really became, why is that? I mean, everything seems to go back to normal. Why would this continue? So we thought, well, let's look at some of the internal parameters and what might be happening inside the joint. So we measured pressure distributions in the knee joint, and this is in the intact knee joint, and this is four months later for exactly the same situation. And we found that the contact area became bigger after anti crucial ligament transection. And here in the darkness, you see the intensity of the pressure and there is less pressure, less peak pressure. And we quantified that in a number of animals. So the contact area was increased by 22% on average, and the peak pressure was decreased. And the question became, well, why might that be? And so in this particular model, what happened was the following. That is, when we measured the thickness of the cartilage in the knee at five different points, in the experimental knee, the one where the anti-crucial ligament was gone, the thickness was much higher, 
and then compared to the control animals and the control measurements. So the cartilage was thicker and softer. And as you can imagine, when you have two surfaces that you press together with a given force that are thick and soft, the contact area will increase and the peak pressure will decrease. So really the conclusion was that even though normal kinematics, muscle forces, and so on was reestablished, there were very quick changes that happened to the articular cartilage in the joint within those first four months that then presumably were the initiator for the continuation of osteoarthritis. And the, the thing that we learned from that is, well, if that's indeed the case and you want to prevent that, not only do you need to get to, back to a normal movement kinematics and normal muscular forces, but you need to be able to do something right away after injury in the joint that this change in the articular cartilage doesn't happen. So the second model that I want to talk about is this muscle weakness model. And that, I roughly call that, we did that in the 2000s. And as I mentioned, that was initiated again by Cy Frank, uh, who had this resident here, and that some of you might know, David Longino. He's still in Calgary. He's an orthopedic surgeon working out of Calgary. And he was a resident at the time. And of course, every resident had to do a student project. That was part of being uh, you know, a resident orthopedic surgeon. And David Longino wanted to test the idea that muscle weakness, particularly in these muscles here in the quadriceps, that these muscles, when they are weak, they are an independent risk factor for developing knee joint osteoarthritis. And so Sai said, well, that's not really my area. Why don't you go to Walter? So we co-supervised uh, David Longino, and uh, he was an incredible student. He still has the record in getting a master's degree in my group. He got a master's degree with four great publications in 10 months, working from five or six in the morning till 10 at night and said, that's nothing compared to being a resident. So he felt he was on vacation. He also, while doing surgery at one point, on a Sunday, we were here downstairs in the vivarium while doing surgery. He also bought a house while doing surgery at the same time. That's David Long, you know. Anyway, muscle weakness. So he had this model. And the question really was, is muscle weakness an independent risk factor for osteoarthritis? The hypothesis was, yes, it is. And I'll show you some results about that. But the interesting thing was that the model that we used then had completely unexpected and far-reaching implications. And I'll mention that as well, because, you know, you have an idea, and then all of a sudden in science, something else happens that you never expected. But let's go back to the muscle weakness. So the way we did that is we injected Botox in the quadriceps muscles of uh, New Zealand white rabbits. And here you see muscles that are not injected and the corresponding muscles that were. And you can see they become smaller, they become weaker, and you can maintain that for as long as you want. So if you every three months inject a little bit of Botox, then these muscles will be weak and smaller. And then <clears throat> we tested the so-called Mankin score. And I would like to emphasize for those of you who know what the Mankin score is, it's a modified score. So take these uh, numbers with a grain of salt. It's not the original Mankin score. And we checked it after one month in control animals that had no muscle weakness. And those were the scores. And then in experimental animals, and those were their scores. And what you see is that all the scores in the experimental animals were higher than any of the scores in the control animals. And the higher score means more degeneration. So it appeared after one month that, yes, indeed, when you induce that muscle weakness, it's not good for the health of your joint. And then here we see a control animal, nice, good cartilage. And I don't think you have to be a histologist to see that after three months, this cartilage doesn't look quite as good. And after six months, it looks even worse. So there's a progression in that particular model with the osteoarthritis. So the conclusion was that quadriceps muscle weakness, at least in this particular model, seems to be an independent risk factor for knee joint OA. And that this knee joint osteoarthritis is progressive. It becomes worse over the time that we measured it. And that also, that Botox is very effective 
at inducing muscle weakness in a very controlled manner, <clears throat> which I didn't show, but that is indeed the case. However, and that's the unexpected side of it, Botox has this effect on the muscles that you inject. So here is a, a non-injected muscle that has a lot of dark, that means contractile material. Here <clears throat> you have a lot of white, which is fibrotic material and fat that invades the muscle. And so we found that there's this fibrosis and fat invasion that happens. And so the reason <clears throat> why this is important for us is because botulinum toxin type A is used very frequently in treatment, for example, of children with cerebral palsy. And so we tested that a bit more in a systematic manner on muscles, where we had one injection, two injections, and three injections, uh, three months apart, and then we tested right after one month for the target muscles, which were in the bunnies, one side of the quadriceps group. And you can see not much happens after one month, but then after three and six months, the muscles start looking fairly terrible from a point of view of a muscle physiologist, a muscle mechanics person like me. But not only that, the interesting thing we found as well was that if you now look at non-target muscles, so the non-target muscles were, we injected the one side, but we also took the muscles from the other quadriceps. And what we found there, not at the beginning at one and three months, but after six months, we didn't find fat infiltration, but we found also fibrosis. So we then detected that Botox, when you inject it at a certain point, it goes into the system through the bloodstream, it goes through the entire body, and it might affect other organs, other muscles, for example, that you really do not target. And that was really a relevation for us and also for the orthopedic community that, that uses that uh, for, for, for treatment and rehabilitation. And then <clears throat> what we did is, we wanted to see, well, after these Botox injections, do the muscles recover? So again, we gave one, two, or three injections, three months apart, but rather than testing a month afterward, we tested six months afterwards. So we wanted to see when the Botox effect has been gone, because that effect goes away after about four or five months, do the muscles recover? And this is the result of one injection, two injections, three injections, they're virtually indistinguishable. So Botox injections do uh, you know, uh, activate fibrosis and they cause fat infiltration. And when one uses that, one has to be aware of that. And uh, neither us nor any other group that I'm aware of has really made longer term follow up, like a year, two years, three years down the road to see whether or not this is, uh, this is recovering ever. So which will be a very interesting study to do. So last, I want to very briefly talk about this, what I call obesity or metabolic syndrome, osteoarthritis of the knee joint. And uh, this is Gillian Hawker, and uh, she motivated this particular study. And this happened at a retreat of the Alberta osteoarthritis team. And I don't know exactly which year it was, it must have been about 2012. And we were up in Lake Louise, and uh, we presented our work to this external board of examiners, you know, that gave us feedback, and Gillian Hawker was one of them, invited by Sai. And <clears throat> we had just given this beautiful presentation where we were talking about these female 15-year-old soccer players that have ACL injuries, and, you know, and then, and then we need to do something about them that they don't develop osteoarthritis later. And, uh, and I never forget... Chilean Hawker stood up and said, this is really nice, but the patients that I'm seeing are female, they are 65, and they are obese. And I'm going, I've never really thought about that. I never really thought about obesity as potentially a risk factor for osteoarthritis. So I sat together with her that evening, Sai joined us, and we discussed what might be, what, what, what one could do. And we realized that a lot of people had obesity models but they were primarily concerned with heart and cardiovascular problems. They were concerned with diabetes. Very few people would ever be interested in looking at joints or the musculoskeletal system. So we decided to do that. And uh, Dave Hart gave us all the advice and all the biology of that model. 
And Raylin Reimer here gave all the advice. She actually had a model of Sprague Dolly rats, an obesity type of model. And so we then wanted to ask the question, is diet-induced obesity indeed a risk factor for osteoarthritis? And <clears throat> if it is, can we then use maybe exercise to alleviate or mitigate or reduce that particular effect? So we wanted to test these two hypotheses, and there's some 12 or 15 papers out there. I'm going to just talk about the very first one and one of the last ones. So one of the first ones was really to test is this a model for osteoarthritis? And so we took these uh, Sprague Dolly rats and we fed them this high fat and high sucrose diet that Raylene had shown would induce, you know, obese animals. And so we knew that from a metabolic point of view, this was working. And then control animals just got their regular diet. And that first study was over 28 weeks. And so the way the study was that we had some control animals, and then we had these high-fat sucrose animals. And after 12 weeks of the 28 weeks, we divided these animals into an obesity-prone group. That those were the seven heaviest animals out of the 21. And you can guess what this one is. And an obesity-resistant one, one that didn't gain weight. Because interestingly enough, you give these animals a high-fat sucrose diet, and not so dissimilar to humans, some get really big and some don't get so big. And so here is a control animal and an obesity resistant animal. And it's probably hard for you to tell which one is which. This one, in fact, is the one that had the same diet as this one, the high fat sucrose, but somehow did not gain as much weight, whereas this is our control animal. So then when we measured the weight of these animals, then by definition and by selection, of course, the obesity-prone animals were heavier. Statistically speaking, we know that that's how they were selected. No surprise there. But what was a surprise was that uh, statistically speaking, at least, I mean, they are a little bit heavier, but statistically speaking, the obesity-resistant control animals were about of the same weight. Then the question became, well, what about the fat percentage, the body fat percentage? Because that's really what obesity is all about. And that then distinguished the control and the high fat, high sucrose animals with both of them, the resistant group and the obesity prone group being significantly higher than the control animals, even though the obesity resistant group was not as high as the obesity prone. So now the question that we had is, if we now look at the knee joint and osteoarthritis, does the weight play a role? And therefore, these two groups don't show any osteoarthritis, and this one does. Or is it the body fat percentage? And these ones were relatively good, and these were not. And I give you three seconds to think about that. <laughs> and then I'll show the results. And the result is this. So here, again, we have a modified Mencken score. So again, don't get hung up on, on the original one. But the control animals were relatively clean, and the obesity-resistant, obesity-prone animals both had much more severe uh, knee joint degeneration, as shown here. So the conclusion then really was that uh, it was not so much the body weight, it seemed, but the body fat percentage. Here are some histological slides with ugly-looking uh, cartilage and menisci and relatively clean joints for the control animals. So this work was uh, done and initiated by my PhD student, Kelsey Collins. And additional findings that she had, aside from the knee joint and some other stuff, was that she found there was an increased local, that means in the knee joint, and systemic inflammation in these animals that had the high fat, high sucrose diet. And also that the gut microbiota in these animals with the high fat sucrose diet was completely different then in the animals receiving the regular uh, diet. And the conclusion was that it was the body fat percentage and the inflammation, the systemic and local inflammation, that likely was responsible for the knee joint osteoarthritis. And it was not the body mass or the body weight, because those animals that had a similar weight with the high fat sucrose animals compared to control, they, they still had um, osteoarthritis. So, 
Then the second hypothesis was, can possibly exercise, mitigate these effects? And that work was primarily done by uh, Jacqueline Rios, a former uh, PhD student of mine. And uh, so here, the exercise was that we had these rats uh, run for uh, 30 minutes every day on a treadmill. And then we had an even better one. This is a resistance training. <clears throat> And believe it or not, these rats, they do that absolutely voluntarily. You give them a little bit of push and, and observe, I'm going to show that again, observe that they have these weight attached to their tails. By the end of 12 weeks of training, they will carry one and a half their, times their body weight attached to the tail and they would march up there. So now the question was, what, yeah, so what does that mean for the body fat percentage in these animals? So as we expected, the high-fat sucrose animals, of course, were higher in body fat than the control animal. But what about the exercised animals? We expected, of course, they would be lower in body fat percentage. And they were not. They were not. They were a tiny bit lower, but statistically, they were actually the same. So they got the bad diet, the high-fat sucrose diet, but still, despite the exercise, they gained more weight they have more body fat percentage. And so we go, okay, so this is not gonna work. They have body fat percentage. Um, <clears throat> this is not gonna work. So we also looked at the entire metabolic profile and multiple parameters. I'm just gonna show you three of them. So here we have the chow animals and the high fat sucrose insulin sensitivity is decreased as one would expect. Triglycerides in the blood are upregulated. Blood leptin is upregulated. The question now became, what about the exercised animals? that are indicated here in red. <clears throat> and metabolically speaking, they were like the controls. <clears throat> so despite the fact that they were, uh, had a fat percentage very similar to the other animals, they had a, a, a normal insulin sensitivity, their blood, tri blood triglycerides stayed normal, and the blood leptin stayed normal. So the question then became, in terms of the Mankin score, What's important here is the body fat percentage, and therefore the exercised animals would have bad knee joint, or is it the metabolic, the regulation of the metabolism, and they would have good knee joints. So here, the control animals, the high fat sucrose, and so the question now here is these ones, and uh, sorry, <clears throat> they were good. They were good in terms of knee joint score. So despite the fact that they, had, that they were obese, they somehow, the exercise protected them, gave them a normal metabolic uh, profile, and the metabolic profile seemed to be important and not so much the body fat percentage. So we concluded from these studies that obesity is an independent uh, risk factor for osteoarthritis if you don't do anything else. And obesity also causes local and systemic inflammation and changes the gut microbiota. And exercise was successful in preventing uh, osteoarthritis in the knee, reducing inflammation, retaining a healthy gut microbiota, which I didn't show, but it was the case. Uh, but it did not prevent, in this particular model, the obesity. And we then called that the metabolically healthy obese phenotype. So we had these two animals that were obese and obese with training, the obesity was about the same, but the ones that trained physical exercise, they were metabolically healthy, uh, the other ones were not. And that seemed to make a tremendous difference in the joint, bone, muscle health, all the other things that I didn't show here. I just showed you the results for the joint. So the way we then summarize this all is as follows. You know, we have all adipose tissue in our body. If you have a high fat sucrose diet, then that adipose tissue will grow, will get more obese. The <clears throat> cells, the adipocytes will get stressed out and they will re release inflammatory markers when they get too big. When they release those, they have an effect on muscles and they have an effect on joint. Um, in terms of the gut microbiota, I didn't talk much about it, but that is normal in, when you eat a normal diet. And then when you have this high fat sucrose diet, it changes uh, the microbiota composition. That causes an intestinal permeability. And one of the things that happens then is that you have this lipopolysaccharide translocation across the intestinal membrane, and that causes 
also uh, has effects on the adipocytes and on the muscles and on the bones, uh, a negative effect, um, degenerative effect. And exercise normalized the gut microbiota. Exercise did not inhibit the fat deposits to get bigger, but inhibited the stressed out cells that then release uh, adipokines, inflammatory markers, and other things that then were presumably negatively affecting the muscles, joints, and the bones. So <clears throat> I come slowly but surely uh, to kind of the end of what I wanted to say here. And I want to make a few points again. Cy Frank was very important to me in 1987, as I mentioned, with that uh, adjunct appointment in medicine, the laboratory, the facilities that he provided for me. He was the one that is directly responsible of me cutting the anti cruciate ligament. And then did I say that get a lot of money from the Arthritis Society and from the Medical Research Council of Canada that, uh, that then allowed us to do that type of research allowed us to get pilot data <clears throat> to then get money from CIHR or the Medical Research Council. He then, for the muscle weakness, sent me the resident, David Longino, who wanted to do that. I took full advantage of that and then was also you know, indirectly responsible by inviting these knowledgeable people in the area, like Julian Hawker, to critically discuss what we were doing in the Alberta osteoarthritis team that then really very directly motivated our work on obesity. <clears throat> so, so people ask sometimes, you know, what, what was Cy Frank's secret? Because as has been shown at the beginning of this uh, introduction here on a very nice video, he had a tremendous influence on many, many people. And as I said, different people have different views. That's kind of going back to my prelude. And uh, it's really interesting. Um, the, the most interesting interpretation of size, uh, of, of size uh, success that I, that I found was I, I, I talked once uh, to somebody and she said to me, when Sai comes to me and he wants something, he always looks so helpless and forlorn. I just want to help him. <laughs> so so that's, that's, that, that was not quite my view. But, uh, but that, that, that's a view that I once heard, and I thought that was, uh, was really interesting. Um, for me, I think uh, one of the things that he had a unique ability is bringing out the best in people. And uh, I don't really know how he did that, but he did it with everybody. And what I always admired is he would take students and people that you were thinking they are, you know, they are maybe average students in your view, but he was able to make them feel really good, really important, and he brought out the best in them by instilling a confidence, by giving them confidence and instilling the confidence. And I, I think that's just something that, that, at least for me, he was just the master, the absolute master in doing that. And then the other thing that he had is, which was sometimes actually slightly annoying. He would work with you on something, would do most of it, got the success, and then the limelight came shining upon all of you, and he just stepped back and said, you go, you go. And so he, he, he just was a person, in my opinion, that was incredibly helpful. But when he came to take the credit and the limelight, he was always very humble, stepping back and saying, well, you go forward, you know, you deserve this more, you need this more than I do. And, and I think that can probably really summarize uh, in one word, and that is generosity. I think he had this genuine, generous personality, this generosity that you don't see that often so unrestricted in many people. And we are not only talking about people, we're talking about tape type A, surgeons, orthopedic surgeons, and type A academic people, very self-absorbed, egotistical people. <laughs> and then when you find somebody with that type of a generosity, not only is that unusual in the general population, but it's, 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 
incredible when you find that somebody being able to do that. And so I thought, from my point of view, that is really what I thought uh, Sai's secret to his success was. And I'm sure you all have your own interpretation and you may or may not agree with what I had to say here. So there's many groups that were involved here and many of my students shown here that have been participating in that type of osteoarthritis preclinical work. So my acknowledgements go to them. Uh, you know, this is obviously a team effort and a group effort and many, many people involved. And at this point, I also would like to thank Diane again for a beautiful introduction, the Cy Frank Legacy Committee for uh, allowing me to do this. And I hope that I was able to talk not only about science and osteoarthritis and what we might have found, but I hope I was also, al also able to kind of bring across the tremendous influence on my career in this area of research that Sai has had. And um, I hope I was able to do that because otherwise I would have failed. And I think I failed anyway, because it's really hard to summarize the contributions that somebody has made, uh, you know, from, from, from the very beginning uh, to the very end, as long as he was around. So I'm incredibly grateful for that. And again, my thanks for you coming and listening to me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Walter, I want to thank you for your very elegant talk that you explain beautifully the pathophysiology of osteoarthritis, your, the important work that you've done, and the contributions that Sai have made. So thank you. We're going to take the next 15 minutes to, uh, for questions. Um, that if you have a question, put up your hand, and uh, someone with a mic will come to you. And if you're online, you can put your questions on the uh, chat. And they're being monitored, and we'll take some We'll, we'll um, take those questions as well. So, any questions from the audience? I should probably be more familiar with this work, but when you were talking about how exercise was protecting the osteoarthritis, you were alluding to the fact that it was also protecting the tissue. Was that histologically shown? So that the muscle tissue itself uh, didn't have the invasion of the, the, the cartilage and the fat that you would assume? Yeah, and, and, and I didn't really mention that explicitly because I was focusing on the knee joint and osteoarthritis. But yes, when, when the exercise was combined um, with the high fat, high sucrose diet, then other tissues like muscles, ligaments, tendons, other things that we looked at were more normalized as well, were more like in the control animals compared to the high fat sucrose animals. Yes, that's correct. So it's not just the effect on the joint, but it seems to have an effect globally on the musculoskeletal tissues that we looked at. Stephen. Um, I'll, I'll start with a comment. I mean, I know you fairly well, Walter, from over many years, and I'll, I'll think back to my recollection of Sai and two very impressive people who I would love to know somehow you both had, you and Sai always seem so relaxed, and I'd love to somehow <laughs> take that from you, <laughs> that part. But anyway, my question is um, two parts, I guess. First off, you start with post-traumatic osteoarthritis, and then you look at uh, metabolic OA, as you put it. Are they the same disease at the end of the day? I, I sometimes wonder that. And the second one that was running through my mind is I was always sort of brought up academically to think that mechanical load was instrumental in driving away. And as I lo looked at both of those aspects, post-traumatic OA seemed, you know, kinematics get back to normal, but the degeneration continues. How can mechanics be instrumental? It might, it might be a side effect, but how, could be, how can it be instrumental? And the same thing with the metabolic OA, it really doesn't seem that mechanics is the biggest part because the large animals versus the smaller animals who both had the high fat uh, or high sucrose uh, diet um, equally developed OA. So it wasn't mechanical load again in that case. So I just wonder if your thoughts on mechanical loading. Yeah. 
<clears throat> that those are very good questions, and you know, I'm not going to have, I'm not going to have the um, the answer here. But I think maybe going to one of the questions that you ask about, are they the same disease? I'm not really a clinician to judge if they are the same disease, but they manifest themselves in the knee joint differently. So in the muscle weakness model, for example, when we look at the knee joint, we find primarily the degeneration in the patellofemoral joint and not so much in the tibiofemoral joint. Whereas, whereas um, in the metabolic model, it's very much in, in, in the rats there, it's very much a tibiofemoral thing, more so, I would argue, than, than a patellofemoral. So, so they have their own signature and they manifest themselves differently. And so is that a different disease or not? Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Joint loading, the, the one thing that I know for sure, well, I think I know for sure, <laughs> is that unloading is bad for the joint. So when you take the normal, the regular loading away, you, you put somebody in a cast, there is very old studies where, you know, in animal models, joints were completely unloaded for weeks at a time, and that is very bad for the bone, that is very bad for the articular cartilage. So yes, I think loading plays a role there. Um, how much overloading or too much loading plays a role, I find that, I find that a very hard uh, question to answer, and I'm actually not really sure what I would say there. Thank you, Walter, for this talk. I'm not quite sure I will enjoy dessert tonight after dinner, but never mind. <laughs> uh, I have a question for you. So you told us what you have been up to in the 90s, in the 2000, 2010s. So you're not done here, right? You know that. So what's, what, what are you working on at the moment and what's coming? Well, at, at the moment in, in the osteoarthritis work, um, you know, I, I was glancing over some of the details, and one of, the, one of the things we found in the osteoarthritis model, in the metabolic OA model, in the obesity model, was that when we look at the muscles, it appears that fast twitch fibered muscles uh, are much more affected than slow twitch fibered muscles. So, for example, the soleus doesn't get any fibrosis, doesn't get any fat infiltration. And of course, when it's a slow twitch fiber muscle, it has a high aerobic capacity, and the fast twitch fiber muscle does not. And based on that, we have started a study, and my students who do that are up there somewhere, where we, where we obtained uh, animals that were bred for their running capacity, like over 50 generations, where Lauren Koch, I, our collaborator, she took, you know, she had these hundreds of rats running, and then she paired the best runners to have offspring, and she paired the worst runners to have offspring, and did this over generations and generations for years and years and years. And so now we have what we call these high-capacity runners and these low-capacity runners. And because of that result of the high aerobic capacity in the soleus, that seems protective, we want to test whether or not, in general, a high aerobic capacity in an animal, in a human being, might be protective. So if you are destined to be a marathon runner and you have that high aerobic capacity, can you eat a bad diet <laughs> and get away with it compared to somebody who cannot run really very far? And so I don't have the results, but the hypothesis is that aerobic capacity might be protective in the presence of a high fat, high sucrose diet. So that's, that's what we are testing right now in, in this particular area. So, so students, once you're done with your rats, come and talk to us about racehorses, right? <laughs> Why is everybody trying to convince me to work with the horses? <laughs> Mike is here, Tilo is here, everybody talks about <laughs> horses. <laughs> Is there a question from the from the online? I have a question from the online audience, and I'm just going to read it. 
Um, regarding the exercise-related prevention of OA, from the clinical aspect, sometimes OA patients are recommended to first lose some weight and then start exercise, since excess weight might cause damage to their knees. Um, could you please explain your perspective on this? Uh, that, that's, that's a very good point. And I have to clarify exactly how we did the study when we did the exercising in presence of high-fat sucrose diet. The results that I showed you were where we introduced the high-fat sucrose diet, and on the same day, we started exercising the animals. Then uh, a student of mine also did a study where we started the high, where we started the high-fat sucrose diet, and then we waited before we introduced the exercise. And in this particular animal model, the Sprague Dolly rat, when we waited before we introduced the exercise, there was no recovery effect. It did not help. So I guess the idea being that, um, that probably establishing good strength um, in a model uh, would, be, would be very important before you do that. And um, unfortunately, what our results would suggest is that you are on a bad diet for a long time and you might be a little bit bigger than you would want to be and then you start exercising that might not have the same effect as if you are a very active person that happens to have a really bad diet. So. Hi, Walter. Thank you for your talk. Um, I had a question about the translation of the cerebral palsy and, and Botox results into the clinical population. And I, as far as I know, I know that Botox is still given to reduce spasticity in some cases and particularly in some children. So I wondered, are we doing um, those individuals a disservice based on what might be happening with the muscle? And, but is it different in a growing individual versus um, an adult? Yeah. Either? That, that's a very interesting question. I just gave a, a keynote lecture about four weeks ago or so in Chicago at the American Academy of Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine. And I talked about these results that we had seen with the Botox. And, uh, and it was very interesting because the way I said it is that we are aware of the clinical benefits. And I showed some examples of children with cerebral palsy and their ability to walk before and after uh, Botox injections. And the, some of the examples that I found, not my own study, they were clearly better, you know, just visually they were better. So I think there is a, there's a clinical effect there that I would argue, at least on some occasions, is very, very good. But at the same time, you have to be aware of that you might do quite a bit of damage to the muscle, and I think people need to be aware of that. And it was really interesting. Uh, I had an enormous amount of attention after that talk for like an hour. People came up to me and there were people that said, you know, from the published results that you have, we already reduced our Botox. We don't do it in our hospital anymore. Especially there were several people from Australia where, where in some hospitals they don't use the Botox injections anymore based on, on the findings that we and other people had. And then there were other people that came up to me and said, you know, you were way too nice to the clinical people. You know, the, the benefits do not outweigh the damage that you do to the muscle. So, and then other people said, well, it is necessary. We need to do that. It delays surgery for two years, three years, four years. It keeps these children mobile. So it's a, it's a big, big, it's a big debate. And, and I got all kinds of feedback at that particular conference where all these people are that do those type of things. Thanks, Walter. Well, I immediately thought about cosmetic procedures too, and maybe you need to go speak with them next, but you know, because it's also used, but it's also used for migraine prevention and yep. stuff. So anyways, lots of interesting yeah. avenues. And I have, a, I have a, an interesting story there. I was once invited to give a, a, a lecture in, in Brazil, and this was about sport biomechanics, and then I heard from the people who invited me, oh, there's a TV station that wants to talk to you about your research. And I said, great, yeah, you know. And so this person from TV comes, they hook me all up and everything. 
And I'm expecting you to talk about the sport biomechanics because that's what I was there for. And this uh, interviewer starts to talk about Botox because somehow she had read that we did all that work. And then her question was, well, what would you do? Would you ever take a Botox injection? And I said, yeah, well, I said, well, you know, I'm Swiss. Swiss people get a lot of wrinkles. I love my wrinkles. I'm never going to take a Botox injection. But, but you know, I've heard of cases, uh, especially what you mentioned is migraine. And I know several people have told me that it's a very, very effective treatment for reducing migraine. So, you know, I'm not a medical person, so I'd be hesitant to say yes or no, you should, you should not. But it is used. It has clinical effects that are beneficial, but it has side effects, I guess, like most drugs or interventions. We'll take one last question. So I just had a question regarding when you're growing up and you're playing sports and they tell you you play high impact sport running, right? So I just was wondering how you control between the two groups looking at your running rat model and your resistance training rat model for high impact. Yeah. So the, the models actually had slightly different results in the sense that in the running group, the metabolic profile was more normalized, and those are the results that I showed you, compared to the resistance training. Also, the, the results that I showed you there for the weight gain and the fat percentage gain, that was for the aerobic training group. Uh, the resistance training group actually had exactly the same, even slightly more uh, fat percentage in these, in these particular animals. But their joints seemed to be uh, better than, than the high-fat sucrose animals, independent if they did um, the running training or, or, the, um, or the resistance training. But there were, there were differences in the metabolic profile. There were, there, is, there were differences in other aspects as well. Yeah. Thank you. So on behalf of our advisory committee, the McCaig Institute, Alberta Innovates, Calgary Alumni, all Access Fund and the University of Calgary. We want to thank you sincerely for the wonderful talk. And this is just a token of our appreciation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat>So I just have a few more things to add before we break, and uh, that is we continue to celebrate the visionary spirit of Cy Frank. Uh, we want to give you a few updates from the McCaig Institute that at last year's event, we announced that there was a new translational impact grant uh, that supported research uh, from early and mid-career investigators, and that rather than being able to support one investigator, we've been able to support two through the McCaig Institute, so that's wonderful. And the second announcement is that the Bone and Joint Strategic Clinical Networks and the McCaig Institute for Bone and Joint Health are pleased to announce the recipients of the Translational Impact Grant in Musculoskeletal Health. And Dr. Dr. Lee Cabell and her team received funding for the project Strength Training for Osteoporosis Prevention in Early Menopause, a pilot study. And Dr. Brenda Ubank and her team received funding for the project Machine Learning in Development Diagnostic Algorithms for Traumatic Soft Tissue Knee Injuries. And with that, I'd like to thank the um, Cy Frank Legacy Committee, the McCaig Institute, and the entire operations um, team of the McCaig Institute for all the planning and hard work they did to put this together tonight. And I'd like to thank the family, friends, and colleagues of Dr. Frank who contributed to the Cy Frank Legacy Fund endowment for their generosity. And without them, this event could not take place. That um, in, we continue to welcome any donations for the fund so that we can keep this running um, for the years to come. And uh, thank you all for attending this lecture. And now if you'd like to join us in the um, Atrium, there will be a wine and cheese reception. Thank you. <laughs>